welcome to a look back at the sky at night. You know, when I began the programs way back in April 1957, I had no idea I'd still be making them every four weeks, half a century later, but that's what happened. And that really is a world record. Good evening. Well, I'm afraid Burnham's Comet turned out to be something of a disappointment. Good evening. Well, as you've all heard by now, there's been another unsuccessful American moonshot. Good evening. We've just had some amazing photographs sent back by the American probe to Mars, Mariner 6. Well, as you can see, we're doing this programme from my home in Selsey, but I've got an old thatched house within sound of the sea. Hello to the first ever Sky at Night from Stonehenge. This month's Sky at Night is about the distances of the stars. Good evening. Last month was one of the most exciting in the whole story of space research. We have really exciting news. Halley's Comet has been sighted for the first time in over 70 years. For once, I'm not in the studio or even on the ground. I am, in fact, in an aircraft flying over the Canary Isles. Since 1957, we've covered every aspect of astronomy, and things have certainly changed. In those far-off days, we believed in oceans on Venus and vegetation tracts on Mars, and how wrong we were. One thing we tried to do, all the way through, is to interest people and urge them to go outside and look up. Look at things like the Pleiades. I wonder if you've noticed these stars arranged in a group. They're in the southern part of the sky at the moment, rather high up, and they're quite easy to identify. And they make up the star cluster which we call the Seven Sisters, or the Pleiades. So let's find out how many stars can be seen in the main cluster of the Pleiades without using a telescope or any instrument, uh, apart from ordinary spectacles, if you happen to wear them? The answer, surprise, surprise, was seven. Over the years, we've done a number of outside broadcasts, but of course, we are always completely at the mercy of the weather. But at the present moment, unfortunately, we run into one of these banks of cloud. What we planned to do was to start off by showing you some stars, and then go on to the moon, then Jupiter, and finally, the most spectacular thing of all, Saturn, the planet with the rings, which never has been shown before on direct television. I can't no. see a single star at the moment. It's totally obscured. George, I'm going to break in, I'm sorry, but they just got a message through from Edinburgh that they've got a picture of Jupiter. So let's go now over to Edinburgh. Yes, there is Jupiter as seen through the big telescope at the Royal Observatory, Edinburgh. That is now a direct picture from the sky. It's not a drawing or a photograph or a recording or anything else. You are seeing Jupiter as it really is at this moment. Well, I'm glad we saw that anyhow. I am too. To the try moon and get this. is just being awkward. The moon is just being awkward at the moment, I'm afraid. No telescope yet built will show a star. It's gone, anything except point of light. Is it gone? Oh, no. Just as I got it on the crosswires, it blacked right out. How absolutely typical. There's nothing we can do about it. I can't move a 24-inch telescope quicker than that. No, I'm afraid you can't. At least we had really good luck with our star party in Celsius last year. If you follow the belt down, you come to Sirius over there. In Canis Major. In Canis Sirius, Major. So then, so in Major. Above. And then, of course, go the other way. Go the opposite way, you then get Taurus, you get Aldebaran, and of course, you get the wonderful little cluster of the Pleiades, which we can just That's see right. about five or six stars. In the garden, there are my three main telescopes, and I wonder how many hours I've spent in using them. Well, I'm afraid I haven't got any space rockets in my garden, but I have got a couple of big telescopes, and the largest of them is a 12 and a half inch reflector in this runoff shed. Shed's very easy to operate. It has the great advantage you can get your telescope working quickly. This is what we call an altazimuth mounting, and you can see you can swing it round anywhere, and it is very convenient from that point of view. But it hasn't actually got the drive on it, and so most of my planetary observing is done with the other telescope, which has got the equatorial mount and is in a dome a few yards away. Well, this is a perfectly conventional telescope with an eight and a half inch mirror, and it's on a massive equatorial mount, as you can see, so it's very suitable indeed for observing the planets. This is my new one. I can't resist showing it to you. This is my 15 and a half inch reflector. And you can see it's pretty massive. Wooden tube. I rather like that. Some people don't. A really massive fork mounting. And it's got to be heavy because don't forget, when you're using a high magnification, you've got to keep your telescope absolutely steady. I hope it's fair to say that the sky at night has encouraged quite a number of would-be young astronomers. For example, this lad, Timothy. 
Well, he's going up now, and here is Sir Timothy Rice in the garden with a great friend of mine, Dr. Brian May. This telescope is one year older than I am, 1946, and it's a 12 and a half inch, quite a famous instrument, really, used by Patrick to do his map of the, the moon, which was the first at the time. And that was what really established him as a worldwide famous astronomer, wasn't yes. it? Yes, of course, no photographs at all. He's just sitting there with his pencil and paper, yeah. drawing it, the entire map of the moon, which is still very useful. He's a, he's a great scientist and great astronomer. He really is. He always calls himself an amateur, but of course, really, he's an honorary professional. What was your first memory of the sky at night? In, back in 1957, it started, didn't it? 57, when I was 10 years old, and um, it was on very late, so I wasn't really allowed to stay up to, to watch telly at that time. Um, but I got special dispensation for the sky at night, and we all watched it, the family watched it every week. Um, and it was just an amazing mystery opened up to me. I absolutely wanted to be an astronomer from that time onwards. I got one of Patrick Moore's books out of the school library and then had to buy it because I couldn't let go right. of it. Um, called The Earth, which I still have, you know, telling you all about you know, the, the evolution of the Earth up to the point of trilobites and stuff. Never forgot that. And it, it's kindled my enthusiasm forever. I got interested in astronomy through a book uh, that my father left lying around the house in, I guess, 1950, 51, when I was only about six. And then suddenly I was aware that there was this program on every month, you know, without fail. And then I realized that Patrick Moore wrote books and, and gradually mm. it all expanded from there. Well, this was the book that Brown talked about and published in the 1950s. When he and Tim came in from the garden, we talked about comets and eclipses. I have a house in Cornwall, slap in the middle of the point of, to of totality, and I was very excited for years, looking forward to 1999 in August. And mm. it was so disappointing because the actual mm. eclipse was cloud-covered. But there was a moment in the clouds where certainly I saw for about 10 seconds, the clouds almost went away, and they went away enough, and I know you shouldn't do this normally, but with the naked eye, you could see the moon three quarters in front of the sun. The sky is totally overcast, only a slight brightening where the sun we know is. And, well, I fear we've got to wait. My we're still well over an hour from totality, and I haven't given up hope yet. There's a break. Look there, there's a break in the cloud, and there is the crescent sun. We're about 15 minutes from totality, and we've just had our first glimpse of the eclipse. And the cloud is there, it's drifting, and there may be hope yet. Look, you see there the crescent sun, and not very long to go now. Oh, clouds, keep away, please. Totality, and the light fades, and down here we can't see it. From the aircraft, of course, we can, but from this ground, I fear we are going to miss totality. There's cloud up there, but you can see the light level going down, the temperature dropped, kind of eerie half-life, not like an ordinary dawn or dusk at all. But I very much fear, from here we won't see the corona, but of course, from the aircraft we can, and the last slip of the sun vanishes, and then there's totality, the diamond ring, and there the lovely corona, a maximum-type corona, Beautifully symmetrical, and that is the sight of a lifetime. From down here, sadly, we are still under total cloud, and we're missing it. The sky has gone dark, and the entire landscape is altered now. And that is totality, lasting for two precious minutes. And down here, all we can see, I fear, is gloom. A few scattered breaks on the cloud, but unfortunately, nowhere near us. I remember at school we had a... Um, because I was at school in Sussex, actually, and, and ours was the only house that had television. We had one really ancient black and white telly in a room known as the Dive, and I can remember, I can remember you broadcasting f from somewhere in Yugoslavia. Yes, yes, it was 1961. Was 61. Well, it's interesting because thank goodness I got that right because that was my last but one year at school. I remember all of us crowding in and people illegally from other houses fighting in this small dive just to see your program from Yugoslavia. There's the sun, the actual crescent which I didn't think we'd see a few minutes ago. The clouds, of, the clouds and the mist will roll away just at the right moment, but the great moment is coming up. And the main thing about a total eclipse, you know, is the suddenness with which, with which it all happens. But that must have been very early days of Eurovision. I mean, not the song contest, but of the ability to do live programs from Yugoslavia. It was the first time that it had been done. We showed the eclipse three times, from France, Italy, and Yugoslavia. The first time it had ever been done. That was a, was a, was a pioneering work. Hello from Yugoslavia. This is Patrick Moore talking to you from what must be one of the most desolate spots in Europe. 
and we're having a most exciting time here. We're in a cloud at the moment, right on the top of this mountain, but we can see the sun. We're now in this wonderful French observatory in South France, and there's one of the television cameras mounted on a telescope in a dome, and I'm actually in a small room attached to that dome. This is Trinity Bridge over the river, which runs through the center of Florence, where at the moment there's a terrific sense of expectancy. The sun is over three quarters eclipsed. There's a weird kind of light. Patrick, one of the greatest memories I will have forever is, there, is the transit party of Venus at your house. Yes, that was a great program, I think. Now we know the transit is about to start. Yeah, I've got it in H Alfred. It's there. It's right on the very limb. I can see it just cutting through the, the top of the photosphere. I can see it just coming in on the edge of the disc now. There's a very small bite. Taken there it out is. Me. There's the inner star. Just first contact, a tiny notch. So, Damien, it's really clear now on the, the projection. We can see Venus is half onto the disc. What's the computer showing you? Yes, it's showing uh, Venus about halfway onto the solar disc now. Uh, yes, it's looking very clear. Um, about four or five minutes' time, we should see the uh, black drop. I can see it quite clearly, and there's no mistaking it now. And uh, even after 47 years of the sky night, something we've never seen before, and like nothing we've seen before. And we won't see again from here, after all. This really is a one-off, and I'm so glad we have these perfect conditions. Exactly. It's nice to have a blue sky for something. It really is. Tell us about it this is. telescope. It's, am I allowed to call it the low-tech way of <laughs> you looking at things? You can if you like. Yes, it won't <laughs> mind. This is my childhood instrument, really. It's, it's a Newton, Newtonian um, reflector, which me and my dad made out of a kit, you know, and it's uh, cost almost nothing. But it does work, as you can see. It's and, a beautifully uh, sharp image, actually. I like, is, I like the coat hanger attachment. I, think that's I was very pleased with that. That was a last minute modification. I think it was invented by Messrs. Heath and Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> there, is that the black drop yes, there? Yes, that's you it. You can see it there. Yes, that's the black drop. We were lucky down here because we had a whole collection of amateur astronomers and professionals too, and we had perfect weather. The entire thing was visible from my observatory. Amazing. And then as soon as the transit finished, the sky clouded over. So we had a perfect day, really. <laughs> Two great musicians, who are also astronomers. Well, I've never had a music lesson, but I do care a great deal about music. And at the start of the sky at night, I had to choose opening music. What should it be? Intermezzo and Corabia Street by Sibelius? Grieg's Homage March? Or the one we finally did choose, an old 78 recording of At the Castle Gate from Pelius and Melisande, again by Sibelius. And I think that was a good choice. But after all, in a way, music and astronomy do go together. William Herschel, discoverer of the planet Uranus, was a professional organist. And on one occasion, um, I did nerf myself and play a piece of Herschel's music on the piano, live. <laughs> I wonder when that was last played. About 1800, I should think. and wise, who were, who were great to work with, believe me. Well, the sky that began in April 1957. The space age began later that year, and in 1961, up went the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin. The first man in space, the first space man in history. You know, if I'd come on the air in 1957, when we did the first of these Sky at Night programs, and said that within five years, I'd be showing you pictures of the first man to go round the Earth in orbit in a spaceship. Well, I think you'd have regarded me as mad. It was also the Russians who took the lead in sending rockets to the moon. And they sent their probe, Luna 3, round the moon and got back the first pictures of the far side we never see from Earth. They had used some of my maps and they very kindly sent me that globe. It's long ago now. Well, this time, also, we were sending rockets to the other planets. 
and two very regular and welcome visitors to the sky at night were Dr. John Zarnecki and Professor Gary Hunt. And talking about the moon, I turned to John Zarnecki. I can remember back in the 1950s when I was a, a, a child growing up, there was tremendous mystique, for example, about the far side of the moon. We'd never seen the far side. In September 1939, the Russians landed their Lunik 2 on the moon's surface, not far away from the great 50-mile crater which we call Archimedes. And then in October 1959, just a bit less than a year ago, came that great triumph with the Russian rocket Lunik 3, which actually went round the moon and photographed that part of the moon's surface which we can never see from the Earth because it's always turned away from us. Well, I for one certainly won't forget those pictures because they came through on the night we were going to do one of these Sky at Night programs and we were the first to give these pictures uh, in this country. And that actually was a picture taken in the studio uh, in October 1959 when I was reading out the announcement. These pictures of the other side of the moon were quite staggering. They were much better than we dared to hope. And this is the first one that came through. Do you remember that one, Gary? Indeed, I think our pulse obviously quickened when it was suddenly decided we will go to the moon, the famous statement, and then the whole build-up to, to the missions to the moon, and a chance to sit down and plan very much what we, we expected to find there. And that's where, of course, your own observations came very much part of it. I think it'll be wise for the first explorers to come down well away from the moon's equator. And my guess for what it's worth is that the first landing is liable to take place in this large, dark plain, which we call the Sea of Showers. I remember, of course, at that stage, there was a theory, not widely supported by people like me, that the entire moon's surface was covered with deep dust drift. We, if we wanted to know exactly what the surface uh, materials were, we could analyse them by throwing out a sticky tape from the rocket and we were drawing the tape back so that uh, possibly bits of the bits of the rock, bits of the dust would stick to it and uh, we could analyse these inside the rocket and send the results back. Well, thank you very much, Dr Fielder, and I'm quite sure you're right when you say that these experiments are going to be interesting, and I think they're going to be made pretty soon. I think you'll agree with that, too, because all the indications are that the Russians are now making such immense progress that almost anything may happen at any moment. Well, this is a scale model of the lunar cob that's now standing on the surface of the moon, and I think this probably represents the greatest Russian triumph yet. And in this model they brought over to the Paris, Paris exhibition, uh, there are all kinds of interesting features that can be seen. First of all, look at those wheels. There are eight wheels altogether that make the thing move, and each one has its own independent set of motors, so that if one happens to fail, the remaining seven will carry on. These showed us that uh, there was a regolith, you know, there is a surface layer of, of, of dust, but it's, it's not uh, too thick. And of course it's generated by impacts, impacts over the age of, of, of the moon, and of course it's impacts that, uh, that generate the craters that we see. It certainly is. Remember the tremendous argument about that? Were they volcanic or were they impact? I was on the wrong side. How did the moon's craters and the waterless seas get there? Well, um, I'm rather a rebel. Uh, I believe, frankly, that they're due to some kind of internal action. You can call it volcanic if you like. But I think this is a minority view, and most people prefer to believe that they were due to the impacts on the moon of huge pieces of matter, meteorites, in fact. The final preparations for a manned landing, when the module was taken down to within 10 miles of the moon's surface, and the pictures sent back were absolutely amazing. And all this led on to July the 16th, 1969, when Apollo 11 was launched from Cape Kennedy. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. What a roar. A great flame over twice the length. And these were the final moments as Armstrong and Aldrin came down toward the Sea of Tranquility, ready for the first lunar landing. 30 seconds. Contact right. Okay, engine stop. The first man to step out onto the moon's surface was Neil Armstrong. And here yeah, you can yeah. see the huge shadow of the module. And here's the module standing on the moon's surface, where it stayed for a total of 22 hours. And here's the shot of the year, or any year. Taken by Neil Armstrong, it shows Colonel Edwin Aldrin on the moon's surface, and it sums up the achievement of Apollo 11. And I think this comes to the two inner planets, Venus and Mercury. And uh, we knew so little about Venus, the planet of mystery. And there's one faint shading there, which is diffuse and not very prominent. That was all I could see. 
And quite frankly, that wasn't my fault, because on Venus, there's very little that you can see. But of course, rockets have now been there, and earlier on this year, two Russian ones, Venera 5 and 6, actually parachuted down through Venus's atmosphere and landed on the planet, sending back signals as they did so. Let's begin with the very first one, the picture of the surface of Venus from Venera 9. And uh, frankly, when I first saw that, I just couldn't credit it. There at the bottom, that um, semicircular thing is part of the spacecraft, and the rocks are very clearly displayed all around it. That there was so much uncertainty about what they would find, they even carried a detector for liquid water. Well, I must say, I think so far as Mercury was concerned, we were fairly right about Mercury. This is Mercury, the region near the crater Handel. And here are some lunar uplands, which I photographed myself the other day. And you can see the general resemblance. Yeah, we had the moonlight object, we looked at Mars. Those yes. first Mars missions, Mars looked awfully like the moon, because our images were so poor, and everything looked a bit sort of dead. I was, I'm an atmospheric scientist in my original training. I went to the States, and they said, you don't want to work on Mars. It's nothing of interest to atmospheric science. Go, go work elsewhere. Yet Mariner 9 turns up in the biggest dust storm we've ever seen. So let's have a quick look now at the very first pictures ever sent back from Mariner 9. And there's one showing a large area of Mars. And near the bottom, you can see a large dark patch. And that's been tentatively identified uh, with a feature that we know called Nix Olympica. Although I think personally the identity is a bit nebulous. Not so long ago, most people believed there was vegetation upon Mars. Well, it's rather unlikely, I think, that any of our higher terrestrial plants would survive under Martian conditions, although it's just possible that some very lowly forms, which we've not yet tested, may. But just to show you the fate of higher plants, I've brought along tonight two cacti. This cactus has been quite healthily growing under Earth conditions, and you see it's quite a nice, firm-looking sort of cactus. This one here has spent one night under Martian conditions, and I think you uh, can see without any doubt that it's got a distinctly morning-after appearance. Primitive life there may be. I don't even think so. Intelligent life, certainly not. So in other words, you rather think that Mars is a dead planet? Absolutely dead as a dodo. This, incidentally, is our only indication of possible life on Mars. Uh, you see in this picture there's a footprint, yes. uh, and this is an enlarged view. Uh, the inhabitants of Mars are, are large, if nothing else. Good evening. This is Mars. Incredible pictures sent back from Viking, showing a red, rock-strewn landscape under a pink sky. The detail is absolutely amazing, and these pictures would have seemed science fiction not so very many years ago. Then far out. Far beyond Mars, far beyond the asteroid belt, we come to the giant planets. Again, we knew a bit about them, but not a great deal. Ron, let's begin our tour between the planets. Right, on this occasion then, I'll be Voyager 1. Now, I was launched from Earth in September 1977, and I was aimed at a point in the solar system where Jupiter will be in 1979. So in that intervening period, I've been moving off in this direction. I've been gradually feeling the immense gravitational attraction of Jupiter, and as I get closer and closer, I'm accelerated towards Jupiter, moving faster and faster, taking my measurements of this planet, swinging around it very close in, and in addition to the acceleration, I'm also also experiencing this deflection effect of the gravitational force, so that I'm being moved into a trajectory that carries me on towards Saturn. This was history, and it's, it's, it's history that, well, firstly had great experience being there from the very beginning. Originally we have a grand tour, wonderful elaborate missions to explore these outer planets. We wanted to know how they were formed, what the satellites were like, and again, where they fit into the origin of the solar system. In fact, if we make a time-lapse sequence, we can first look, for example, Patrick, at the way Jupiter appeared during the Voyager 1 flyby of three months ago. What I would like to focus upon are the way spots move in from the east and circle around the red spot. They take about six days to go around, and spots during Voyager 1, in fact, circle around for about ten rotations. Here's a rerun. This is still Voyager 1. Look at the red spot and note how it spins round. On the way to Jupiter, that's a, we're seeing Jupiter from the spacecraft. We're seeing these tiny little dots of the satellites. The geologists will ask, what do you expect? And the quote, and they won't mind me saying so, was that they expected you know, Io to be fully cratered and an extremely old surface, right the way out to Callisto, which is going to be thoroughly smooth. They were so wrong. 
Let's begin, shall we, Gary, with the Voyager 2 picture of the outermost of the Galileans, Callisto. And I think the important point is we're looking at a face patch we haven't seen before. This is the nice thing about having two flybys. We can see other aspects of the, these satellites. And again, it's totally cratered. There's not room to put any more craters down. Now, Voyager 1 is closing into Saturn, nearly 950 million miles away from the Earth. And even when still 50 million miles from Saturn, it began sending back spectacular pictures. Yes, even at this distance, Patrick, we can see the, the rings with the main division showing up and also, in fact, the evidence of Titan showing up in the picture as well. Here we go. Voyager coming into its closest approach of Saturn, the closest man had ever been. That's it. And here are the cheer from here in JPL. And Voyager has now passed its closest approach of Saturn. We've got the signals back and it's now started its never-ending journey between the stars got to say more or less the newest thing we've found, which was the discovery that the F-ring is not, uh, uh, not circular, it's eccentric. Not only is it eccentric, it looks like it's raving mad. So Voyager 2 is on its way, with Neptune far behind. Its story is not over. It should remain in touch for the next quarter of a century, by which time it will have reached the edge of that part of the galaxy where the sun's influence is dominant. After that, who knows? It could even end up in some alien museum. But of one thing I'm certain, Voyager 2, the most successful of all unmanned spacecraft, will never be forgotten. Well, since then, of course, um, one more mission we must mention here, because uh, one of the latest guys now, it's Cassini to Saturn, and you were so deeply involved in that one, John. Indeed. I mean, do you remember that we talked about this, when was it, in, in the early 1990s on... on, on on yes. an earlier sky at mm -hmm. night. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of interest in the nature of the surface of Titan, particularly over the last 10 years since uh, Voyager gave us a lot of uh, information about Titan. The, the interest really stems from the fact that we really might be dealing with here a liquid-covered surface. And, of course, we, we, are, we arrived at, uh, at Saturn, what, just, just over a year ago? Yes. And uh, January the 14th of, of this year, Huygens landed at Titan. Well, I've actually just found out that uh, the probe has been on the surface for at least 45 minutes and is still transmitting. I think I can reveal now, it's pretty close, that we haven't splashed down. I'm not sure what we've hit, but it's something softish. We've got a, a, an impact deceleration of about 15 G. So it's that, that, that could be equivalent to, I'm not saying the surface is snow, but it's the sort of thing you'd get into semi, uh, deceleration you get in semi-compacted snow. It's fair to say we've learned more about the surface system planets now because it was impossible when we began the Sky at Night program. What we've shared in 25, 30 years of the most extraordinary period in history, we've seen not only every object except Pluto in great detail, we now understand a lot more about our planetary neighbours, and also it's given us a new view to look back at the Earth. It's also impacted on our, our understanding of how we all, the Sun and the planets mm -hmm. and all the mm -hmm. entourage of, of satellites and so on, originally evolved. I mean, we, we certainly can't answer all of the questions, but uh, we, we have, I think, a better understanding. But there's still a lot, uh, a lot, of, lot of questions it's to be been, answered. It has indeed been a great period. John, Gary... Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. This is my lovely old orrery, and we used to use that to open the programme until the two Ronnies decided to take a hand with disastrous results. It could be that uh, somewhere in the universe, some being at this very moment is looking at a television screen and seeing. Well, good evening and welcome to the sky. Now pay attention because I've got my eye on you. That was Mark Yarwood as me. Quite a good impersonation, I think. And you know, many interesting people join me in the sky at night. You remember the great comedian and scientist Michael Benteen? I recall myself as being the most complete skeptic about the idea that flying saucers are spaceships coming from other worlds. I don't believe a world of it, and um, I'm quite sure that all the sightings can be explained much more easily than that. But I don't think you quite agree. Well, I'm a hopeful agnostic. I sincerely hope that one day we will meet an alien, but 
so far I've only met about 2% uh, of the sightings which really are, are totally inexplicable as far as I'm concerned. And I'm also fascinated by the aerodynamic shapes of the UFOs themselves. I mean, look at this frisbee and look at the way it flies. It's quite extraordinary, look at that. Caught it. <laughs> Well, Michael, we used a frisbee, obviously, because it is aerodynamically shaped. And when these things were first reported, they were always known as flying saucers. I'm not quite sure when they changed over to UFO, but a flying saucer it could be. But the uh, people who have reported them uh, say that there are other shapes as well, don't they? Yes, indeed. We've got the famous Havana shape from Cuba, the cigar up there, which launches the little saucers, apparently. And then you've got the dumbbell shape. Now, I like that one. And, of course, you have the, the famous lampshade model. Oh, yes. <laughs> Worn on the head, it looks very, very attractive. I think that people will believe anything. What about that famous divorce case? Is it true? It's absolutely true, and I've met the chap concerned. He was an American, and he wrote a book a long time ago now called Aboard a Flying Saucer. And he described his adventures aboard a craft from the planet Venus, piloted by a beautiful lady whose name, I think, was Mrs. Aura Rains. Apparently, he had a very good time indeed. His book came out as non-fiction, a true adventure, and um, his wife promptly sued him for divorce, cited the lady from Venus, and she won. <laughs> First interplanetary scandal in history. It's absolutely fabulous. There's not much outward resemblance between, oh, shall we say, a jellyfish and uh, an ant uh, and a man. At least I very much hope not. But they are all based upon carbon and they all need certain conditions. None of those conditions exist on the moon. Where do the saucers normally come from? Well, normally they come from due north. One finds them hovering over that particular cot, which I see. is uh, quite renowned now, really, yes. that particular cot, because so many people have seen them up here, you know. What would you say has been your most exciting experience up here? Well, I would say that the most unusual, as apart from exciting, the most exciting was when one of these small spheroids chased us through the cops, virtually. And we tried in turn to chase it, and it just went along there at a terrific pace. This was no bigger than a soup plate. Good time. Must have been a, a robot eye or a brain yes. beacon, yes. Like a thinking beacon, yes. which is sent down from the yes. craft to make observations. Yes. Is there life elsewhere? Well, we don't know yet. One man who had very definite views about this was one of the world's great astronomers, Dr. Harlow Shapley, and I talked to him in a very early sky at night. So where life can appear, life will appear. But is it going to be the kind of life that we know, or is it going to be something entirely different? The biochemists who work in that field and study molecular structures believe that uh, life is going to originate and develop if it's based on carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and hydrogen for the reason that our studies of the stars always show the same chemical elements hydrogen helium carbon nitrogen and so forth the stars and we are made of the same stuff we're proud of that that we're made of star stuff perhaps the stars are <laughs> glad that they're made of human stuff i wouldn't know about that paul johnstone who suggested the program produced it for some years. Since then, I've had two long-term producers, Pat Outram for 10 years and Peter Marpoga for over 20. And we've been to some amazing places and seen some remarkable things. We did um, programs about eclipses. Oh, that first eclipse was tremendous fun, wasn't it? Oh, the one where you went to Siberia. Yes, I know. Yeah, I remember you came up to London carrying a rather battered small suitcase. I've um, still got that sake, yes. And your mother rang me up and said, can you please see that Patrick doesn't throw his pullover out of that suitcase because it's full of magazines and cameras and he's going to Siberia where it may be very cold. He hasn't got an overcoat. Um, and I did, I think, make sure he didn't throw the pullover out. This is a perfectly glorious sight. And watch for the diamond ring effect as the sun reappears from behind the eclipsed moon from behind the shielding body of the moon. There's the garment ring. You can see the prominence over on the left-hand side of your screen. A large prominence there. In a, in a few seconds now, it'll be over. Now the corona is disappearing. There's the re reappearing sun once again. There's the sliver. And the light is coming back to the valley. The sun's back with us, even if it is, well, mainly above the mist. Oh, well, that really was lucky. And then when you got back to London, they were going to have a, a really big press conference on this eclipse. And in the swamps of Siberia, your shoes were disintegrated. And the Russians had very kindly wrapped sticky tape round and round and round to enable you to fly back to London. And your blazer pocket had a tear in it, which the Russians had kindly pinned together with safety pins. So we went off to give this press conference. 
And I, I remember sort of summoning up my nerve and saying, Patrick, I think after all these years, we really could afford to buy you a suit for the sky at night. And you said, you don't need to. I've ordered one at Moss Bros. <laughs> yeah, well, I, 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 I wore my suit, didn't I? You did. <laughs> of course, in those days, all so different, all black and white originally. Yes. I kind of remember Eric Eilert. Yes. Eric Eilert made these beautiful models. By the time it's gone round ten times, it will have covered a total distance which is greater than the distance between the Earth and the Moon. But, of course, before him there were Wormsers. The Wormsers. Wormser used chorus girls with long black gloves. That's right. There's a model of the Hyades star cluster. Now let's bring in Aldebaran. Now, Aldebaran, you might imagine from this, is very close, or indeed inside the star cluster. First of all, here's a globe to represent Uranus. And here's a globe to represent the Earth on the same scale. And you can see there's a very considerable difference. Our own very insignificant sun is some way out from the nucleus. It's well out towards the edge. There it is, you can see it on the edge of the pointer. As the sun slowly rises, you get the central peak, the shadows inside draw back until finally, when the sun is high over the crater, there's no shadow left inside it at all. Whilst it's traveling this part of the distance, it's transmitting its data back to the Earth, it takes its photographs during this little, I've stopped it now, to show during that 20 minute period, it takes 15 pictures and we can see on the surface of the planet the, uh, the footprint of the, of the pictures. But now, let's follow our space probe in to Mercury. A strange little world, not much larger than the moon, a long way away from us, and virtually without atmosphere. It looks like a giant Catherine wheel of stars rotating around, and it's probable that it probably resembles Andromeda rather than M33. And here am I, standing inside the local group, and you have to imagine I've been blown up by something like 10,000 million, million, million times. This was constructed in your kitchen yes. a few moments ago. <laughs> With a lemon and two hoops. <laughs> yes, uh, the lemon, as, as you'll realize, immediately represents the sun. The uh, purple hoop is the orbit of Venus, and the yellow hoop is the orbit of the Earth. We also used to involve the public quite a lot in... We did. Like when we went to Stonehenge for oh, the, uh, yes, the Druids. rising of the sun on Midsummer's Day, we did take the precaution of recording it the day before, which was reasonably clear. The day itself, of course, it poured with rain. There was nothing but wet Druids. Look forward to the all-illuminating day. Flood it with mercy, with wisdom and with love. And so, exit the Druids. I haven't the slightest doubt that the sun rose, but unfortunately we didn't see it because it was total cloud coverage. But it didn't stop the Druids holding their service, and um, after all, there's always 1973. We also had an experiment with um, the Leonid Meteors. Oh, yeah. It didn't go entirely right. So what we did was to have large numbers of star maps printed, and these were issued to people who said they would cooperate. We asked people to stay up late at night from about midnight to dawn and record any meteors they saw and send us in the results. I can't incidentally resist quoting one letter from somebody who very kindly watched from midnight till dawn and sent in the following report. Watch from 12 o'clock to 5 o'clock in the morning. Meteors from the sky, none. From the wife, plenty. And I think that just about summed it up. We went to a bigger eclipse in oh, Africa. Yeah. Africa, yes, that was, that was great fun. On the Monte Umbe, yes. with 300 amateur astronomers. We made a, a homemade device in wood, which uh, is based on the pivots, so it'll move in both directions. Gerard, what are you aiming to photograph during totality? I want to get the corona, and if possible, the diamond ring and Bailey's beads, but first and foremost, the corona. And how are you coping with the problems of stability? Well, I've got this curious object, which is known as a rifle pod. Mm -hmm. It was made for me by an international marksman. Yes. This curious-looking windmill is yet another mounting for a telescope and camera. It was specially designed to overcome the movement of the ship by John Rowland. And gradually this sort of violet 
darkness came over the sea. It was very, I don't know, amazing Zero. moment. Within a few seconds from daylight, the whole ship was plunged into darkness. And there's the corona, and there's a brilliant prominence to the side of the sun. This is incredible, the best corona I think I've ever seen in my life. My first programme was um, when we filmed at Mount Palomar. Oh, yes. But well, Palomar, of course, was still, up till very recently, was still running the programme we made in... They're running it, they're yeah. running it today. Yeah. <laughs> they're still running it now. Yeah. When, when did you make that programme? That was 1980 we shot that. The mirror's coated with a thin layer of aluminium, and by thin, I mean thin, the tiniest fraction of a millimetre. It's this aluminium film which collects the light from the object you're observing, and so the whole telescope, with its 500-ton mass and its 1,000-ton dome, exists merely to move this flimsy aluminium layer around. We did a programme about volcanic activity. I remember that, yeah. And we went up Mount Taidae and extinct... Well, it's not extinct, well, it's a volcano, but it's yeah. warm on top if you put your hand on it. And that was when you were standing there and you were supposed to say, look at all that fantastic volcanic rubbish down oh, there. Yes. Oh, yes. And you were wearing a hat. Look at all that volcastic... Look at all that volcastic... Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Blast and hell. <laughs> One of the other highlights was you talking about the moon Apollo missions mm. oh, was yeah. the Eugene Cernan. When we were doing the 25th anniversary programme, we Eugene wanted... The, the last man on the moon, That's so right, far. and we wanted just a, a couple of minutes, didn't we, from a, yes. and one of the moonwalkers to actually talk about what it was like to be on the moon. I was strolling on the moon one day In a merry, merry month of December now, May, May Oh, what a nice day Oh, 99, proceeded, 3, 2, 1, ignition Right away, Houston That's your good He's just started talking just fantastically well So uh, you gave me a look to say, should we continue with this? And we did, and... We were then on film, a roll of film 10 minutes long each, and we used 17 minutes of film and made a 22-minute program in the end. The Earth, it, it's life, it's color, it's, it's, it's beauty, and to me, far beyond even stepping on, on, on the surface of the moon is to think back and look back at home, at our star, at, 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 at our Earth, at our planet. But to actually have somebody sitting opposite us saying there are no trees, there are no telegraph poles, so you don't know how far away anything is. It was that sort of thing that even now as I tell the story I can sort of feel the, the hairs on the back of my neck go up because it, it, he was so emotive about it. But there's no trees, there's no roads, there's no houses, there's no telephone poles. So depth perception and distance is very difficult. You would look at something and instead of being a kilometer away, it might be 10 kilometers away. Do you remember Meteor Crater? Yes, yes. But looking down into the interior, it's pretty barren, you know. Nothing very much grows there. And I think it's officially classified as a desert. But I said a really good end shot would be Patrick doing his piece to camera mm. and then the helicopter takes off and you said that was one of the most eerie experiences because you were like on the moon. You were completely, there was nobody else, you couldn't hear anything, you couldn't see anything. It was getting dusk, it was just too. In, And it was getting dusk, and it was just this vast mm. bowl that you were in. Makes you wonder, too, what it must have been like to see this meteorite coming down so long ago. There would have been a streak in the sky, probably a good deal brighter than the sun, uh, an immense volume of noise, and then this shattering explosion that would certainly have destroyed all life within a wide radius of it. It was a great period, great fun, we saw a great deal. I say, Pat, <laughs> Peter, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. One thing we always try to do in the sky at night is to take complicated subjects and explain them in terms anyone can understand. Quasars, pulsars and so on. I hope we succeeded. Well, the tides, as you know, are due to the influence of the sun and the moon. And when they pull together, as they're doing at the present moment, uh, the pull is added, you see, and we get high tides. Granted that the forces are enormous, just how big are they? It's absolutely tremendous. There's no doubt at all of it. Also, the tides is the biggest 
natural force in the entire world. Until you know the size of an object, you can't tell how far away it is. And the same applies to two lights. Look at these. They appear very much the same, but in fact one is much brighter than the other, and I'll show you what I mean. This is a powerful light. And this one is simply a small pocket torch. But until you knew that one was further away from the other, there was no way in which you could tell. Will you please close one eye? Doesn't matter which one. And then hold up your finger and line your finger up with my nose as you see it in the television screen. Got that all right? Now, without moving anything, use the other eye and you will see that my, your finger is no longer lined up with my nose. And if you keep everything quite still and flick your eyes around like that, you will see your finger apparently flashing to and fro. Paul, representing 61 Cygni, the nearby star, is moving very obviously compared with the background stars. Not because he's really moving, but because the camera is. You can see there's a very obvious shift. Of course, in this, it must be exaggerated, but the principle is absolutely valid, and it does apply to the stars. In one sky at night, I tried to show the principle of radar by throwing up a tennis ball and then catching it on the rebound. If I throw a tennis ball against this groin and then catch it, well, if I know how fast the tennis ball is going and I know how long it takes between my throwing the ball and my catching it, well, I can tell how far away the groin is. I caught it on the eighth attempt. In 1968, we did a very interesting program about mysterious objects, pulsars. We now know what they are. They're rotating neutron stars. We didn't know then. We were completely mystified. We thought the signals might be signals from intelligence. Uh, and it was only after several weeks that we had a closer insight into what these fantastic signals uh, were really about. Well, the first person to identify these strange things, we now call pulsars, was Jocelyn Bell, and she joined us on a programme sometime later. So we appeared to have a radio source that was sending out flashes of radio waves every one and a third seconds. Suspiciously man-made, actually. When did you decide that they, were, they weren't man-made? Very quickly, because they went round the sky with the stars. They kept sidereal time, which means that it had to be something going round literally with the stars. I suppose it might have been a satellite in a funny orbit, but we eliminated that. And it couldn't have been anything earthbound, except possibly other astronomers, because they're the only people who keep time with the stars. What then about the life story of a star? We decided to try and illustrate this, and um, I took part myself. I can picture myself as a red giant, but not, I fancy, as a white dwarf. So what I propose to do now is to join the HR diagram. And I'd like you, if you will, to um, stretch your imaginations very considerably and imagine that I represent an evolving star. And at first, the light is unsteady. It's what we call a T tori variable. And it joins the main sequence. And this is where it spends the major part of its active career. Then, after a very long period indeed, the supply of hydrogen starts to run low and your star leaves the main sequence. And the outside swells out and cools down, the inside shrinks, and the star enters the giant branch. And of course, when that happens to the sun, it's going to be the end of the Earth. What then about black holes? Probably the most bizarre things in the entire universe, so far as we know. I've got here a pair of objects, mm -hmm. a dustbin and a bag of rubbish. Yes. If I were to shoot this towards a black hole, a rotating black hole, and allow the rubbish to fall into the black hole, this will come whizzing out yes. with lots of extra energy. Yes. Could we tackle something so abstruse as relativity? Well, we tried. Suppose we imagine two-dimensional people like this little circle. Uh, the, the people have no idea of what three dimensions are. They are flatlanders. And let's imagine this is the world on which the flatlanders can move. This is spherical, but they don't understand the meaning of three dimensions. It's, it's a flatland as far as they're concerned. Now, suppose we introduce a dimple into this. When this little person's moving across there, when he comes to the dimple, he suddenly drops in and whips out. And he says, hello, I've experienced a force. I've dropped in and I've come out. 
I've experienced a force. But I say in my wisdom, oh no, you haven't experienced a force at all. You have come across a distortion in geometry. You think it's a force. I, in my wisdom, know that you've merely had a change in geometry and you interpret that as a force. But if space is curved and finite, then what's outside it? Oh, that's not a fair question. You see, you're asking me a four-dimensional question, and I'm not a four-dimensional person. I can't think four-dimensionally. <laughs> Here I am, um, in a lift, going three-quarters of a mile underground in Boulby Mile towards this strange observatory. Why are we going so deep? Well, we are uh, going to look for dark matter at the bottom of the mine, and the reason why we need to go underground to look for it is to shield this very sensitive experiment from the deluge of electrically charged particles that are always raining onto the Earth, the so-called cosmic rays, which would interfere with this very sensitive equipment. We know about the seven wonders of the world. What about seven wonders of our universe? Things we found out in the last 50 years or so. Welcome back to Professor Carlos Frank. Carlos, what's your first wonder? Well, I think uh, in chronological order, I think of the seven biggest discoveries of the last 50 years in extragalactic astronomy. I think the first one that comes to mind was the discovery of the quasars in the 1960. These are the most uh, powerful objects known in the universe, which we now understand are actually galaxies, probably in early stages of formation. And formerly thought they were just faint stars. We've said something about quasars. Now, quasars were totally unknown in 1957 when we started these programs. They were only identified after 1963. And quite honestly, we don't know even now just what they are. But if modern ideas are correct, then a quasar is immensely remote and super luminous. They are certainly the most baffling things known to astronomical science, and they illustrate, I think, how much astronomy has progressed over the last 10 years, even though we don't yet know the answer to the problem of these quasars. It was only much later that uh, astronomers realized not only that they're galaxies, but that in fact they're being powered by these very enormous supermassive black holes. That's number one. Number two, I think I go for the cosmic microwave background. And I couldn't agree more with you, Patrick. I think the other big discovery in the 1960s, 1965, was indeed the discovery of the microwave background radiation, which we now know and knew then already is the heat left over from the Big Bang. First of all, what about the Big Bang? A very good question. What about it? Let's have a big bang for a start. Now, I must admit that the first 10 to the power minus 45 seconds are a bit uncertain as to what happened in that period. But after that, increasingly, we're getting a good handle on events and the theory is beginning to be rather well formed. And uh, this discovery gave us direct evidence that our universe was once very hot and very dense, and that it had indeed begun with the Big Bang. And that leads on to wonder number three. I wonder if you would agree with me, Patrick, that uh, the third wonder must have been the uh, discovery of dark matter around <laughs> galaxies like yes. the Milky Way. You know, about the last thing I expected to find down here was a pool table. Um, why? Well, this is to illustrate how we detect the dark matter particles as they come into our detectors underground. And if we assume that the white ball represents one of the nuclei inside our detector and the red balls represent the WIMPs, represent the dark matter particles, it's like a random game of pool. These particles are flying past our detectors. Most of them just miss, but occasionally one will hit one of the nuclei in our detector and cause that nucleus to move. Yes, but what is dark matter? Ah, we do not know what dark matter is. It's one of these great mysteries. We know it's there, it's definitely there, and uh, it is responsible for the way galaxies behave, but we do not yet know what it is. This is one of the great big open questions in science. Right, what about number four? I think the 1980s was really a glorious period in theoretical cosmology, and in particular, uh, two key ideas were elaborated then. One was the idea of inflation. That idea has uh, shaped our contemporary thinking about cosmology. And in the 1980s as well, the, uh, what has now become established as the accepted model of the universe, the cold dark matter cosmology, was also developed during that, that decade. It's a decade when being a theorist was absolutely wonderful. Right, next. Number five was, of course, the discovery of small so-called yes. ripples in the microwave background radiation, which we now understand are the seeds from which galaxies were eventually to grow. And the other one, which is closely related, was the discovery in the mid and late 1990s of primeval galaxies, galaxies caught in the process of formation. 
What's new in the world of galaxies? Well, a lot of exciting results are happening, and nearly all of them are coming from the Hubble Space Telescope. Here's a montage of what those uh, very distant galaxies look like. Here's one with four subunits presumably coming together to form uh, a single object. And here's another one that's interacting, two units with, uh, with some extension. And clearly we're seeing evidence that these very early objects are forming for the first time and assembling themselves into larger structures. So I would call that uh, this, uh, the wonder number six. Well, that leaves us one wonder. I know my candidate, he may not agree, but I will go for dark energy. That is really, truly a profound wonder. And, uh, and a mystery. And a mystery. And a mystery that uh, may take many, many years to unravel. Well, those are our seven wonders. Now, let's look forward, shall we? Make some forecasts for the next 50 years. There'll be seven wonders then. Of all the discoveries that may be made, what's the one you would most like to know? Of all the likely and perhaps imminent discoveries, I hope you will agree with me that the one that would transform our whole society and our whole civilization would be the discovery of life outside Earth. Extraterrestrial intelligence. Yes, ETI. I wonder. Well, we must wait and see. Carlos, thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Well, I hope you've enjoyed looking back at the sky at night over the past half century. It's certainly been an amazing period, and we've seen amazing things. And I wonder what's going to happen in the next half century. Well, time will tell. Good night. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, that was absolutely great. One of the most exciting things I've ever seen. I don't see why they shouldn't uh, resemble us. I really don't see why. Well, Fred, what do you think of the planet Earth? To be frank, old man, not very much. The sky is now completely overcast. Good night. Good night. Good night. And even a small telescope will give you a superb view of this magnificent cluster of suns. Good night. And I'll look forward again to seeing you next month. And thank you for watching us. And remember that beneath those deceptively cool-looking clouds, there are scorching hot craters. But I may well be missing something. I wonder. More about Sputnik on BBC4 as a satellite's tail marks its 50th birthday. Next. <laughs>